Our next speaker this morning uh, will be Dr. Tracy Kugler. Uh, Tracy uh, has been a long-term colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. Um, Tracy is an associate professor of pediatrics in the Division of Critical Care, uh, serves as the vice chair of the uh, Medical Center's Institutional Review Board, and is an assistant director of the McLean Center. Um, today, uh, Tracy is going to speak to us on the topic uh, of dead donors, time to remove the ethical roadblocks and proceed with caution. Dr. Tracy Kugler. Hello, Mark. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, when I was asked to give this talk, some of you may know because I've talked at ASBH and so forth. I strongly believe in organ donation and I strongly believe in donation after car uh, what has historically been cardiac death, but more, it's now been changed to donation after circulatory determination of death. We keep changing the name, I think, hoping it's gonna go away. Um, and so I'm really gonna talk about that today. And I, I need everyone to understand, I'm not coming from the transplant side, I'm really ca coming from the family donor side. And I thought this was an odd place to have this talk, but after the first two talks this morning, I think you're gonna find that maybe it's not as such an odd place because I'm really looking at the donor families when all is said and done here. Um, I have a long history with this, which I had to reflect on recently for a lot of reasons. I actually was lucky enough to be a medical student in Pittsburgh when they were debating doing this in Pittsburgh before the Kennedy Center publication in 1991. Um, when I got to do my fellowship, I was greeted at the door by my fellowship director who said, since we can't convince you to go to the lab and you wanna do ethics, we've had three families request donation after cardiac death and we don't have a policy and we don't really know that we wanna do it. so." Here's your research project for fellowship. <laughs> and, and so I really have been at the groundbreaking level of this, and I really think that we're looking at this the wrong way, and hopefully in 10 minutes I can at least give you some ideas on that. Let me explain what donation after, car after circulatory death is. This was in the New York Times in 2006, so we've been debating this a long time. 15-year-old girl is in a hospital with brain injuries from a, car, from a car accident. The trauma and bleeding are extensive. She's got extensive head injuries. She's never going to wake up. She's going to be in a persistent vegetative state. Her family requests to take her off the ventilator, and they request that she be an organ donor. She's not brain dead, which typically is what we expect for organ donation. So although her brain has completely shut down, she continues to breathe occasionally. So they have to go through donation after circulatory determination of death. And she's able to donate liver and kidneys. Donation after circulatory death, the, it's a decision in which the patient has decided or the family has decided to withdraw life-sustaining therapy. And in the adult world, it may actually be the patient because this could occasionally occur with COPD, ALS, or high spinal cord injuries. The physician and the organ procurement agency, which in Illinois is Gift of Hope, determine if the patient is a candidate on medical grounds. And then there's a discussion about possible donation with the family, including methods for donation. The organ recovery method is that the patient is taken to the operating room. Life support is withdrawn there by the patient's physician and comfort medications are given so that there is a palliative death. Death is declared after five minutes of pulselessness and the definition is asystole, V-fib or V-tac. In my land of pediatrics, it's 99.9% .9 of the time asystole, which makes me a little bit more comfortable. The incision is made, the organs are perfused with cold preservative and recovered, and if death does not occur within 60 minutes, the patient has to be removed from the operating room and continue comfort measures in some other location, either back in the ICU or some hospitals would take them onto a palliative care room. So, 
The big ethical dilemma is that heart and respiration have ceased. The big ethical dilemma is are they dead? And everybody's arguing over this five minute piece. And this five minute piece is lots of things, um, but I think this five minute piece is over a dead donor rule and I really feel like at this point this is ethics just continuing to talk about the same issue. The IOM has discussed this three times and has decided that cardiorespiratory death is death. They actually in the last one started to question whether brain death is death. And so I feel like we need to really get beyond this and actually look at the real issues. And the real issue is the yuck factor. And why is the rest of this? And what is the yuck factor? And I, tell, and I can tell you from personal experience, the yuck factor exists. I wish I could make it go away. Having done several of these cases, I can't. I can't make it go away for me. And I know I can't make it go away for my colleagues. The death is occurring differently than what any physician is expecting it to be. We're doing it in the operating room. No one wants death in the operating room. Surgeons don't like death in the operating room. Anesthesiologists don't like death in the operating room. OR nurses go into OR nursing so they don't have to deal with death. It's a strange place to die and to do it intentionally. The patient is surrounded by the hospital staff and by the OPO staff. In addition to the family, if you bring the family into the operating room. And that's a very unusual way to deal with withdrawal of life support. It's usually one nurse, maybe the physician, but many times the physician leaves the room and it's the family. We have all the monitors on and I promise you everybody in that room is watching the clock. And that is really all we're doing is watching the clock and watching the monitors. And that is a very unusual way to be dealing with a dying patient and a, di and a family of a dying patient, is for everybody to be watching that clock, but we're all watching that clock. And giving appropriate pain medications does feel different. I've had more than one colleague say, every time I gave a dose of medication, I wondered if it wasn't going to lead to the last breath and am I really killing that patient? Where when we're doing it in the ICU, they all tell me that we do the same thing, but we feel different about it. We absolutely feel different about it because we're all watching that clock. And I have at least one colleague that finally gave the medication she thought needed to be given to a patient after the clock time had expired because she was afraid that someone would perceive by her changing the medication she was giving because the medicines she was giving were not alleviating the pain, someone in the room would consider it that she was doing it to kill the patient and not to provide palliative care. But after the time clock ended and the patient was no longer a candidate, she switched her pain medication. And that absolutely cannot happen moving forward. And that's a big, problem because we actually get so worried. People are worried we're going to give too much pain medication. I'm more worried we're not giving enough pain medication for the patients that actually do have neurological function. And then if you do bring the family into the operating room, you have to whisk the family away so that the transplant team can whisk in to take the organs. And that seems really unusual too, to have a family have to leave immediately. So how do we get through this? First of all, do families care? And having done this several times now, some do a lot and some really don't. Um, luckily, most families don't experience lots of death in an intensive care unit. Um, and especially in pediatrics, I unfortunately have had the rare family that's had to experience it twice. But losing one child in a family is highly unusual and thank, as, as a child is highly unusual. So this is the first time they've been through this and whatever we say, they're gonna pretty much go with. Some families actually do not want to be in the room when we withdraw life support, so this does not seem so foreign to them and actually it relieves them. 
for other families, I need to get them into the OR. And organ donation is very important for some families. I've had multiple families request, and I've had multiple families come back and say it's a great thing. I have also had some families state, both locally and at national meetings, that things went really bad. And that's not okay either, and we need to figure out how to do that. And they want to trust the team. It's the most important thing and having the wishes respected. So how do family, what do they really care about? They do want patient dignity, so we have to make sure that we're doing that throughout the dying process. They want to be prepared for what's going on, so we actually have to tell them what to do. What's going to happen, how it's going to happen, who's going to be there, because there's going to be lots of faces that they have not seen before. We've got to stop and ask them what they want and what's important prior to withdrawal and at the time of withdrawal. Sometimes it's having their religious beads with them. Sometimes it's having, in the land of pediatrics, it's making sure the child has their blanket or their stuffed animal or that we still do handprints because we do handprints. Sometimes it's having their minister there. Sometimes it's having their little sister come in. Whatever is important, you've got to make sure that happens. It's making sure the grandparents get in from out of state. Whatever's important, you have to make sure that happens and respect those wishes. And they also have to feel like someone's in charge and knows what's going on. And this is the piece that I think we're missing. So the barriers. The problem is, is that there's lots of players when we do a DCD, and they all have very different levels of knowledge, and they all have very different goals. So you have an ICU team who maybe has done this before, but probably hasn't done this before. And if we do it at night, which it usually happens at night, because interestingly, most families want to withdraw at night, and most of the time, that's the only time to get an OR available to do something like this. And if you do it at night, unfortunately, many institutions still believe that residents are capable of running the hospital at night. And so now you have a resident doing this who is on their ICU rotation for the month and may or may not have a lot of guidance. And I really think this is when the attendings have to stay there and they have to stay dedicated and they have to continue to work with this. And so you've got an ICU team going into the OR. We don't ever do that. So we don't really know our way around the OR. The ventilator in the OR looks very different from our own ventilator, so ideally we probably should bring our own ventilators into the OR, but that means you've got to get respiratory therapy to do that. Then you've got OR nurses, and as I said, OR nurses don't do death and dying. And then you have a transplant team that is likely not to be from your institution, even if you're a transplant institution. So you've got surgeons coming in from St. Elsewhere that you've never met before that may be an attending again or may be a fellow. And then you've got an OPO, and I will tell you OPO teams change a lot because it really is sort of a depressing job to be dealing with dead patients or dying patients every single day of your life. So they get lots of young people interested in going in, but fundamentally most of them burn out in three to five years. And so you've got this whole team of people that have never met each other before and don't know anything about each other. And so how do you deal with that? And so then we don't talk to each other, and then the whole thing just breaks down. And everybody feels like they're really more in isolation. So my solutions to this, I have really encouraged hospitals to look at using palliative care teams to work with this and get palliative, team, palliative care physicians to do this. And having talked to several palliative care physicians today, I understand you have all become overworked and underpaid and you're working too many hours and this is not exactly going to improve your lifestyle. But I think it makes it a much smaller group that really knows how to do this and really maybe can figure out how to work the system. I also wish that transplant surgeons would decide that even for the liver that rather than flying in from wherever that you try to use local teams and then perhaps Gift of Hope could set up local teams in each city or each location and say this group of people is always going to come out to your institution and let's have some conversation about how this can be optimized 
so that there's some conversation there. And the other thing is really having dedicated organ donation teams that include social work and chaplaincy and physicians and nurses that are really invested in this process. I do think that families need the choice for organ donation and I hear too many ICU physicians go this family would never agree to donation. I've got my donation story that makes me ask every family. There's a 12 year old that came in as a John Doe. He sat in our ICU for three days as about a 12 year old John Doe. He went to brain death, he was a, he was a gunshot wound. Mom had to come in, finally after being on the news, mom came in, had to identify him, had to be told he was dead, and had to decide about organ donation, and she agreed to donate. They were homeless, they had been in Chicago three weeks, and he was walking to school. If that mother can donate, every family has to be asked. And we've got to devote the resources, because if we don't devote the resources, families are going to have bad experiences, and that's not okay for any death. And good life, good end of life management will lead to organ donation rates going up, in my opinion. Questions? Questions?